Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Oxford Union event with John Blinko. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the page. My name is Dara Sandal. I'm a second year student at St John's College, the chair of the Consultative Committee at the Oxford Union, and your host for today. Now to introduce John Blinko. Mr. Blinko is an American space industry executive. Having previously served as a commercial pilot for over two decades, he is currently president of the Gateway Foundation, which seeks to build the first true spaceport, and president and CEO of the Orbital Assembly Corporation, which seeks to establish an industry for construction in outer space and build large structures in low Earth orbit and beyond. It is an honor to welcome him to the Oxford Union today as we discuss his work, the future of the space industry, and the new frontier it truly represents. Mr. Blinko, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure. Over to you. Thank you for having me. Um, I was asked to, uh, to kind of tell a little bit about what we're doing here. Let me go ahead and introduce myself a little better. Um, I flew uh, big jets uh, for the last 20 years of my life. Uh, most of my time was on a 747. Uh, I was based out of Asia for a long time, uh, many Asian airlines there. And uh, in the last year of my flying, um, uh, the way I remember this happening was I remember sitting in a bar looking at an old image of a rotating space station, a big one from the movie 2001. And I asked myself a question, how come this never started? Why didn't we do this? This was supposed to happen by now. And I had this idea that it, maybe it was just financial. Maybe we just had to have the funding mechanism to make it work. So I started the Gateway Foundation. And the Gateway Foundation is, is really about doing one thing. It's about funding the first spaceport, a rotating spaceport. And uh, we, we started out with putting up a website and we started looking at options of how to start a worldwide lottery to fund the construction. But we knew then that if we were going to do this, you know, we would have to have a space construction industry formed. So that's where we would start. So in starting the Gateway Foundation, we were obligated to uh, go down the road of starting a space construction industry. And there really wasn't one. There was only NASA building things and they really only built one thing. They built the International Space Station. And they did some repair jobs like on Hubble and they fixed uh, Skylab when it broke too. They're just, they're, that's it. That's the, that's the state of the art of, of space technology for, for space construction. So a couple of years into it, we realized that it was going to be us. We were going to have to start the space construction industry by forming a space construction company. And that is what Orbital Assembly is. Orbital Assembly is designed to become a large scale space construction company. There's other companies out there doing things, building things, smaller things, but Orbital Assembly's job is not to build the smaller things. Our job is to build the big things, to figure out how to put together large structures. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, uh, we, we incorporated, we formed the, the design, the engineering team. And uh, this last summer, we started in the summer of 2020, we started our first hardware project of building a demonstrator, which was called the D-Star. Now, some of you might have seen images of this. And if you go to the orbitalassembly.com uh, website, you're gonna, you're gonna hear about the D-Star and the P-Star, which will be the follow on. But D-Star, which we fabricated last summer, and we're taking delivery uh, in about 30 days. D-Star is a ground demonstrator of a large truss building machine. Now, we're gonna have a demonstration of how this thing works uh, after we get it delivered. We have to work through the kinks a little bit, but about, about two months from now, we're gonna have a demonstration. And our goal is to show you 100 meters of truss built in 100 minutes. And uh, that's when we're gonna basically empty out the magazines from the D-Star as it builds its truss. The truss is two meters by two meters and as long as you want, as, as long as the magazines can keep feeding this. That's the ground demonstrator. Once that's done, we're gonna to move to the next stage, which is the P-Star, the prototype of the STAR. STAR stands for Structural Truss Assembly Robot. And when we launch the P-Star, we're gonna build a, a very interesting structure, uh, three, maybe four years out, but we're hoping for three. And it's called the gravity ring. It is a ring shaped truss. And we've been hoping that we could launch it near the International Space Station so that the astronauts can come over and visit, basically go for a ride. But the truss is 60 meters in diameter. And once again, it's the same structural dynamics of two meters by two meters. Our threshold goal is just to build the ring truss, but we're gonna put propulsion on it. And then we're gonna spin it to generate gravity. That's a secondary mission. 
Now, there are extended missions beyond that for the gravity ring, where if NASA wants to get involved, and we've been talking with them, a lot of them, and they are interested, they may want to put some type of habitation at polar opposite ends of it. Uh, we may put a central trust on the center of it uh, so that there could be a docking mechanism there for dragons and so forth to come up and bring people there instead of having to stop it, stop rotation to, to load people on board. So that's P-STAR, which will build the gravity ring. Now, our goal in building the gravity ring is not just to build a small demonstrator. It is to learn the technologies that we need to, 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 um, to perfect towards building something much bigger called the outer ring truss, the ORT. The outer ring truss is the big truss which supports Voyager Station. If you are at the orbitalassembly.com web, uh, website, you'll see images of Voyager Station. This is our go-between before we can build large spaceports. This was our, our goal for a first project or a manned project. Uh, so, yeah. And anyway, um, Voyager Station is going to have 24 very large modules all the way around it. Each of those modules is 12 meters by 20 meters. The interior volume of each one of them is larger than the International Space Station. And yet the cost of building it will be only one third of the International Space Station. How is that possible? One, launch costs have come down a lot. The Falcon 9 launches for about $1,000 a pound. That's down from $3,000 a pound on other launch facilities and down from $10,000 a pound from the shuttle. But that's just the Falcon 9. The next big rocket that's going up is Starship. And that's gonna bring down the cost of bringing things to orbit probably again by another factor of 10, maybe down to a couple hundred dollars a pound. That's the biggest reason that we can make it cheaper, but that's not all. One of the other reason that we can make Voyager Station, which is going to be quite large, cheaper than the International Space Station, is all the components are the same. When you look at the imagery for Voyager Station, you see these big modules, you see these big elevator tubes, you see these access tubes, they're all the same. It becomes like when you build uh, airliners. You don't just build one. They'd be very expensive if you did. But if you make a fleet of airliners at a time, then the cost comes down considerably. So those two dynamics working together, lower launch costs and the lower, lower price of the modules because we're mass producing them is what's going to bring down the cost of Voyager Station. The follow on to that is why you're listening today. This is how people, middle class people are going to get their chance to go. Now, it's not going to be really that affordable for the first run. Here's how it's gonna go. We have an economic model for Voyager Station. We call it 532. Our most expensive room would be $5 million for a stay there. That's only one tenth of the price of going to the International Space Station, which if you've studied it is not a very pleasant experience. We don't even wanna talk about the toilet. The food's terrible, but anyway, um, that's the most expensive one. $3 million gets you the next level of room down, which is the deluxe room. And then the last, the smallest room, which would be $2 million for a stay, that's the standard room. That 532 model can pay off that station within five years. And the numbers, the economic numbers of, of, of getting the loans and then paying them off, that is the key to doing anything in space. If you draw out your, your repayments for your investors longer than that, they start to lose interest. So, the key to what's going on in space, the key to getting you into space is going to be that economic model. We've been able to do the engineering for quite some time, but to make it affordable is the most important part. Now, I know what a lot of you are saying, you're middle-class people, you can't afford $5 million or even $2 million, but think of Voyager Station as the Boeing 707. When they made that first airliner for Boeing a long time ago, the only people that could afford to get on it were the jet set, the rich people. But what it did was it introduced the next jets that came along. When Boeing realized that this model works for rich people, they could make jets that were more affordable. And that's what brought us the 727, the 737. Those were jets that brought middle-class people all around the world. That's what we're doing with Voyager Station. True, the first one's not gonna be very affordable, but the second one, V2, V3, and so on down the line, those are going to be affordable. So you're saying to yourself, oh, I'll be going to V2 or V3? No. Just like the old 707, when the new jets come out, of course, the rich people are going to go on those. They're cheaper once again. But that's when Voyager Station is going to be even cheaper than those follow-on stations. So that's how you're going to get to Voyager Station. How many people can this station handle per year? 30,000 if we have a three-and-a-half-day stay. 
for 288 guests continuously with a two week shutdown for, for maintenance over an overhaul. And that's kind of the story of where we're at right now. I'm ready for any questions, Dara. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I'd like to start off by kind of touching upon really the role of the private sector at large. Um, you know, you talk about how there's been a slashing of launch costs after the entry of private sector companies, mainly SpaceX. Um, you also talked about how um, you're going to be using the mass production model as has been used in airliner manufacturing, for example, um, and um, replicating that when it comes to um, your project. Do you think this really just demonstrates that the private sector is probably a lot better suited to um, taking up the role of exploring this new frontier? Or do you think the government could have done this? Or was that unlikely? The government could have done this. Um, the bigger governments, the superpower governments, Russia could have done something like this. Um, America could have done something like this too, if they were given the budget. Now, they wouldn't be as efficient as, the, uh, as commercial companies would be because they, they're, they're not really designed to do that kind of thing. NASA's charter is science. It always has been from the start. Their, their job is to go up there, figure out you know, how the moon formed, how, what, what we can do in space. And they're really good at that. They've never had the charter for taking tourists into space. They've never had the objective of trying to get the money back from the money they put out there. So their model is all wrong. Um, but don't get me wrong about the people inside NASA. They're brilliant. Uh, we work with a lot of NASA people and there's a lot of NASA people who are really excited about what we're doing because they see um, a possibility to, of something that they wanted to do. Maybe their reason for even getting into the whole space race originally was because they too wanted to go into space and they thought somehow NASA was gonna get them there. I think we all know now that national space agencies are never gonna be the answer. That's not how we're gonna get there. And there's a lot of national space agencies now, which is also really cool. But what's going to happen is it's going to be the people who can make money by taking people up there. And the pioneers on this, what I call the first seven, are those first seven citizen astronauts that went up to the International Space Station. And the first one paid like $20 million. And then the last one that went up there paid like $35 million. And one guy even went up twice. But when you hear about their story, when you read their story about going to the International Space Station, it's not pleasant. You know, they got up there and, you know, it's like, you know, well, so where do I stay? And, and they, they throw you a sleeping bag and they say, you can sleep wherever you want. And, you know, and, and when it comes to food, you know, you're eating out of a can. And, uh, and, and you, we don't want to talk about the bathroom. The zero-G toilet is kind of this nightmare. If you read the stories about how they used it and the, mal the malfunction that they were kind of having, it's, it's rather unpleasant. One of the, the station commanders, um, I can't remember her name right now. Anyway, she was telling about how the, 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 the toilet kind of works, it's kind of like an outhouse. But what they didn't tell people about until recently was that she at some point had to put on a glove and get in there and pack things down. Now, when you pay $50 million to go to the International Space Station, they don't make you put on the glove and go pack things down, of course. You, you just get to use the, the facilities there. But going to Voyager Station is, is a completely different experience. And the number one thing that's gonna happen when people go there is you're under gravity now. You can walk around. You know, people who get to the International Space Station, they don't feel very good. They say they, they feel like they're doing a headstand all the time because all the blood rushes to your head and they get this thing called moon face. When you're, when you're seen on TV or you're to the other astronauts on the station, you got this big head for a while and you don't feel very good. You're congested. Things don't move the way they're supposed to move under gravity. So when we take people to Voyager Station, even just, we hope just a little bit of gravity, lunar gravity is what we're gonna spin for. They're gonna have a much more pleasant experience toilets that flush, beds that you don't float away on, um, a restaurant and so forth. And we can do this because we're gonna have 288 guests at a time. And we're gonna do that continuously. Every three and a half days, we'll have a Starship come up with another 288 guests and that 288 goes down. So that, that rollover is going to make it economically possible to have a station that is an experience that's one-tenth the cost and a thousand times better. Yeah, and, and you... You know, being, being a pilot, you're obviously probably familiar with how the 1978 deregulation of the airline industry in the US kind of, in a sense, sparked a boom and it really led to far better things for passengers, lower ticket prices, um, more frequent flights um, on the routes they wanted. Do you think we're seeing such a moment in space 
right now, not in terms of deregulation, but just in terms of a boom? Or do you think we're going to see a far greater boom a few de- years down the line? I, I, it's starting right now. Um, you're, if you're in the space industry, you would feel the energy of what's coming. When, when the Falcon 9s first started launching and landing, um, they brought down the cost to $1,000 a pound. All these projects sprang up. They would became economically possible. But that's not the big one. We're all just uh, shivering with anticipation about what Starship is going to do because it's got such a huge volume. Our projections, our cost projections are based around Starship. Our, um, our ambitions are based about what it could lift. And so when Starship launches and lands for the first time in a couple of years, I'm not talking about the test flights right now, when the, when the real one goes up, our aim is to be ready. We want to have our first space construction machine to go up there with it and to build the gravity ring so that, uh, so that the two systems of launch and construction become symbiotic. Because if you think about it, Starship is huge. It can launch every single satellite that, that we've been launching this year in only a couple of months time. It's gonna launch, come down, gas up and go again. That's the goal that Elon Musk has set for his rockets. Launch, come down, gas up and go again. Uh, 10 times before you have to do a full scale inspection. So you see this extraordinary potential coming down the road, very close, just a couple of years away. And most people don't know about it. I do because I'm in the space construction business. Well, we kind of are the space construction business right now, but we'll have competitors eventually. We, we are being approached by different people to build different things. Um, a very respected person in the, in the space industry has come to and said, you know, we want to build uh, solar power generation on orbit. You know, can you do it? And we're like, yeah, we can do it. And he's like, well, how long would it take to do this? And we'd tell him, you know, our machines are designed not the old way of putting things together like the ISS, which took years. We can, we can do what you're talking about in only about a week. And, you know, he's like, a week? And we're like, yeah. And that's the way they're designed. We have to do it fast. We have to get our investors' money, uh, uh, investors' uh, input generating a return. That ROI is, is the key to what you're doing. They got to put their money out and they got to start getting their money back. And that's when the sector is just going to explode with all kinds of different projects. Yeah. And so you think Starship then is really the, um, you know, it's really going to be that inflection point when, you know, the whole space industry booms and really OAC as well, because it seems like your entire um, plan is really centered around Starship in a sense. It is. It is. Elon's planning even bigger rockets. But, you know, for the next 10, 15 years, Starship's going to do it for us. Now, the modules that we want to build for Voyager Station don't fit inside Starship's fairing. Uh, we've, we've been in talks with them about, you know, about creating a larger fairing uh, to take the modules up on top. It would basically mount it on top as a way that we work. And that's going to that's be an ongoing discussion. But, um, but Starship is the key to, to so many other construction projects that we want to, to move forward with. And, and people are ready to move forward. People get their money ready to go. And our machines are going to build them for them. They're going to be going through testing. And when Starship's ready, we're going to be ready. Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, I also would like to kind of congratulate you on uh, your recent stock offering. Um, how much of an impact has this really made, uh, both in what's going on right now and also um, your future plans. Yeah, our our first raise was extremely exciting. Uh, the whole team got on the on the video and, and told people about what was going on, and mostly told them about themselves because it's a, a very a very talented team. Uh, we're lucky to have the people that we do. Um, but what we found was that our following out there, our membership, the Gateway Foundation's crew, and the Gateway Foundation's uh, free members. You know, they were ready to go too. Uh, so when it came time to raise money, you know, within a week, we had all that we we're looking for, for the seed round. It was like, wow, you know, we we're expecting to run for 60 days till, till April 1st. And, you know, we had it all, you know, right there it was, you know, so, um, we are going to have another round and, uh, and, and it does, it's not just for accredited investors. We thought we'd be moving on to the, cre- the big investors, the accredited investors next, but we can, uh, raise more money for, through non-accredited investors. Just, you know, join the free membership and you can, you can invest. Um, during the Gateway Foundation free membership. Um, but uh, that'll be our A round. And, uh, and so uh, those who didn't get in in that first round, they can come back for that A round. And we expect that to go down in about four to five weeks. Yeah. And, and so what, how different 
is it really do you know have to report to shareholders what are your shareholders saying to you right now about your plans well this is something i love to brag about we got the best shareholders in the world because they're they're our membership They've been with us for years. They know our story. That's one of the reasons that it, it all came together so quickly. These people have been waiting for the opportunity to invest in the space construction industry, to invest in orbital assembly, to see this moving forward. And now they've had their chance. You know, they, they, they've come in for the first time and they'll probably come back again for the second round. And then we're gonna bring in those large scale, those credit investors. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been so lucky so far to have this, this team, this, this membership that's helping us do all this uh, to, to move things forward quickly. Uh, we're expecting good things to, uh, in the next couple of months and the next couple of years too for, from investors and, and from also from an engineering point of view, the things that we're going to be doing. I think that's one of the reasons they get so excited is, you know, for the first time they can see like the D-Star, uh, you know, we showed them some images of the D-Star, this large scale space construction machine, you know, moving trusses through it and so forth. And so there's that energy there too from the, from the actual construction. I'd, I'd like to talk a bit more about you because it's quite impressive. Um, you know, you've got some amazing ex NASA people um, all on your team. How did you get them all together? And what was it that really made them decide that, okay, we want to go um, and get into the, not only the private, private space industry, but the private space construction industry? I think they were ready like I was. I think they were asking themselves the same question. How come this never started? Was it just because no one decided to go out and do it? Um, so the team formed with the objective of, you know, we're going to do this because we know it can be done. So it, it, it actually came together uh, um, quite fortuitously. Um, people with the same objective of, of building large structures in space with existing technologies, nothing new there, um, and used in a different manner and so forth, um, got together. And, and, and the more we started looking at, the more potential we saw, the more uh, systems that were either in development or already developed. A good example of that is the Canada Arm 2. We're gonna use a lot of those arms and we've had numerous discussions with MDA, um, uh, started five years ago in Pasadena and, and also again recently after the company kind of split in two, there's now an American side and a, and a Canadian side. So, um, you know, we're, we're talking to them. Now, and the funny thing was when we started talking, I said, look, you know, Canada Arm is great, we love it. You know, we talked to you guys about five years ago. Is there anything new? And they came back and said, yeah, there is something new. We're going out with Canada Arm 3 for NASA's uh, Deep Space Gateway that's going to orbit the moon. I said, you know, this is great, you know? So it's, it, and there's another company that's also making pods. Um, like in the old movie, the, the 2001, they had these pods that moved around. We need pods for heavy construction. And it turns out there is a company that's developing pods. Genesis Engineering has a NASA contract. They don't call it a pod. They call it a single person spacecraft but it is a pod. And so when we learned about this, we're like, you know, this is great also. And uh, NASA spacesuits, um, they're using the old ones right now, but they have new ones in development and the company that makes them, um, uh, uh, International Latex Company, I can't remember, something like that. Um, they have another one coming up, but NASA hasn't bought it because they're, they're, they haven't had a need for it. They're, they're using the International Space Station, so they haven't bought the own, their own spacesuit that they've developed. Well, good thing for us, we need a new AVA suit. So, you know, that's one that we're going to grab onto. It's called the Z2. Yeah, and I think that actually um, really does the upon one of the questions that our, one of our members have submitted. Um, this is from Stephen Walker, who asks, how much do you cooperate with other private companies and governments versus competing with them? We're, um, we're working with NASA where we can, um, especially with gravity ring. Uh, our, our goal when we built the gravity ring was that we, we think we figured, you know, NASA at some point is going to realize that zero G as far as, health, as the astronauts health goes, is not really working out. They're going to want to move to artificial gravity. They're going to want to move to rotation. So we've been, we've been approaching them with, you know, this is going to be your next big research tool and you don't have to pay for it. We're going to build it. You can just come up with extended mission options. And they're very excited about that. Um, but that's from the lower level people, the, the scientists and, and the people in the, in the space program who want to do this thing. That hasn't been um, acknowledged by NASA officially. So we're telling them, start talking to the people about the options you have, because they probably don't even know about this. So as far as space uh, 
um, national space agencies, that's one of them. We're approaching other ones too. We're approaching ESA, we're approaching um, the space agency in Dubai, we're approaching the Australians. Uh, the Canadians want to build, um, there's a Canadian company that wants to build solar power platforms. But in the near term, a lot of the people that we're working with right now are those who can help us with space construction tool development or who already have uh, uh, things that are being used in space that could be adapted to our needs. One of the, one of the most exciting ones is it's this little company. Um, it's, uh, I always pronounce it, Kitely on Technologies. And they're developing electron beam welding heads for space operations, mostly manufacturing. But uh, you know, we got in contact with them through uh, an esteemed uh, space industry expert, Gordon Rosler. And uh, these guys want to build the weld heads for us to help us manufacture things in space quickly. And it it's looks like another a really good relationship that we're, we're moving forward on because it can help us a lot. Yeah. Um, and with the kind of space at which both OAC and private, the private space industry more generally has just been booming in the past couple of years. Um, it seems that government regulation has kind of been a few steps behind it, like several steps behind it, probably a mile behind it. Um, do you see the government at some point trying to catch up and regulate the industry more? And do you think that that's going to pose any issues or obstacles? That's a good question, Dara. Um... Here's a, here's a conundrum for, for, for NASA, maybe not other space agencies, but it kind of it does translate a little bit to the other ones. Um, what are they going to do with these legacy programs they have that are kind of falling behind what the industry is doing? And an example of that is SLS. They, NASA's been working on this big rocket for a long time because they're NASA and they move slow. And all of a sudden, SpaceX came along and they've got a bigger rocket that's, that's going to go roaring by them pretty soon and be you know, one-tenth the cost of SLS. What do you do with that? Do you stop the program? Um, do you keep going with it? Right now, they're keeping going with it. Um, you know, and NASA's agenda is always going to be science, I think, and that should be. But like, like scientists who get on an airline and, and go to another country and, and do archaeology there, they use the hotels that are there, they rent the cars from car rental agents, they use all the commercial options to get themselves there affordably. NASA's going to do the same thing. Um, SLS is not going to be around in 10 years. They're going to they, they're gonna probably do a couple of missions with it and they're going to call it a day because SpaceX can take them up one tenth the price. So it, it's just going to be this, the, the, well, this conundrum is going to resolve itself financially, is what's going to happen. Um, and NASA is going to continue to do what they do. And ESA is also, and JAXA, they're going to continue to do science, important science for the commercial sector to take advantage of. And that's why the gravity ring is so important because they can learn. They can take. They can start doing all the studies for low gravity uh, um, studies of what how it's going to affect the astronauts and people living there, and that's going to predict what's going to happen in the future when we start designing spaceports. They're going to come to us and they're going to say, "Hey, lunar gravity is not working out so great. Mars gravity is what we want." Or, or maybe they're going to say, "Lunar gravity is great, you know, and that, that's what's going to that's what we're going to target for for future structures." Um, it's going to be a, a, a hand in hand operation. They're going to be doing the science. We're going to be doing the building. So, so you think that NASA is just going to kind of completely back away at some point from, uh, you know, trying to do the building? Do you not think that there might just, NASA might just, you know, try and stay in it for the prestige or whatever? Um, because at the end of the day, NASA has been doing it for quite a while. Well, they're going to stay in it um, and, and they're going to be at the cutting edge of the science part of it. Um, they may be the backers of, of, of some things uh, monetarily that are going places like back to, to the moon, going to Mars and so forth. Um, but they're going to be drawing on the commercial sector for the equipment that they use. So, you know, when we start uh, building cities on the moon, which will start probably in 10 years, maybe less, it, you know, NASA people are going to be there. They're going to be saying, you know, what we learned about the regolith is, you know, you can you can do this with this, you can do this with this, but you can't do this, and that's how we're going to design our cities there. So, it, it, you know, we're going to be walking hand in hand with ESA people and, and JAXA people who are going to be doing different things, um, but it will be the commercial sector that's providing the equipment and keeping the cost down to allow for that expansion. Yeah, and uh, you know, you got you kind of mentioned a little bit about where you see. Uh, things going in 10 years but before we talk a little bit more about the future I wanted to talk more about well you and your background um, 
So you used to fly 747s. You, you were a pilot for over two decades. Um, what was it like moving from the commercial aviation sector as a pilot to do, you know, the space sector? And um, how has your training as a pilot really affected the way that you're going about things? Good question. Um, I miss the flying. Flying was fun. Um, but uh, the, one of the problems with flying is you're always all around the world. You know, the, the day I dis- decided to do this, I stepped off my 747 for the last time, it was October 1st, 2012. And, uh, and I've been thinking about it for months and doing some work on, on starting the Gateway Foundation. But um, I walked out of that one life and I haven't flown one little bit since then as a pilot. Um, I've, I've been on a lot of aircraft going around the world, you know, for, for business and for pleasure. But uh, I, I, miss, I miss the flying, um, but I don't miss the life. Um, one of the things that uh, was frustrating about flying was it's not growing like what, what we're doing right now. You know, I see so much potential in the direction I'm moving. Flying was just flying. I was just a pilot. Um, now I'm doing something that's far more important. And um, in, in the strides just in the last couple of years, the, the successes that we've had are, are extraordinary. You know, to be able to build trust like that with such, with such speed and accuracy. Um, you know, when you, when you realize you can do that and all these people start approaching you and you, you hear about NASA, people getting excited about what you're doing, you realize you've, you've, you've done something really important and, and it's gonna get more important the, the more we move forward. Um, right now, we're forming a space construction industry around orbital assembly by buying things from people who can, who can deliver to us to help us build things. Uh, the companies that I mentioned, uh, Catleon Technologies or MDA, uh, all these, these companies that make these things, we're going to be their buyer. You know, we're going to say, you know, this is what we need in, in arms going forward. You know, we're going to tell someone, uh, someone else that we need bots that can do this um, in an automated fashion. Uh, we're going to need drones. Um, we're designing some of them ourselves, but some people have drones that are almost ready to go. Uh, one of them is called Bulldog. I can't remember the name of the company that makes it, but uh, we're considering buying one of those to send up with the gravity ring. Um, the Observer drones, which we talk about on our website, um, we're probably going to build those uh, from CubeSat designs. The difference that for, between regular CubeSats and our Observer drones is they're refuelable, rechargeable. So they come back to their base, they refuel, recharge, and go back out again to take more shots of, of what we're doing during construction. So this is all happening around us. And the way it's happened, the way it's affected my personal life is for the first time in my life, I'm not just doing something that's fun or exciting. I'm doing something that's really important. And, you know, people tell me that and it feels good. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought I'd kind of move back to, um, well, back, back to the future. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier that you see in 10 years um, us having cities on Mars. Um, so kind of on the question of the future, where do you see us A, 10 years, B, 20 years, and C, 50 years from now? Um, you know, let's say at this point, Voyager was a success. Um, you know, the Gateway's got a steady rotation of visitors. What does life in space look like at this point, and what is OAC's place in it? Really good question. Um, we, we have a roadmap, and I've kind of laid it out for you, but let me go ahead and formalize that. Gravity ring is the first thing that we're going to build in space, and it's going to rotate. It's two really important things, building something big fast and rotating it, because as we said, the future is in rotation. Um, within just a couple of years after that, we plan to start construction of Voyager Station. And that of course is a big rotating space station, but it's just a space station. That's our forerunner to the, what we call the age of spaceports. And the first one that we wanna build of those is the Gateway Spaceport. Gateway is different from Voyager Station because Voyager Station is a bunch of modules. Gateway is continuous uh, pressurized volumes. Uh, Tauruses is what they are. Large, you, you've seen the interiors in science fiction novels and pictures and so forth, where they show these, these, these large areas with people living, some of them so large to hold cities. But a spaceport isn't made to hold little cities inside with, with uh, railroads between them. That is a settlement. That's the follow on to building a spaceport. You build a big spaceport, now you can pretty much build anything. 
And now you can start building settlements, which are where people live all their lives. They live in space. That's that, uh, you know, George Jetson kind of, you know, people who live up there maybe come down to Earth, maybe not. Maybe they just go to the moon on their vacation. You don't know. That's the real golden age. But what I'm pointing out is, you know, between gravity ring, Voyager stations, you know, the gateway spaceport, that span is only about 10 years. When you start building spaceports about two or three, maybe five years after that, you know, that's the golden age. We're, we're going we're gonna to live through this period in the next 15 years where we're going we're gonna to know people who go into space and they don't come back. They go up there and they, and they live in one of these settlements. And, you know, they, they talk about, well, do I really want to go back into Earth's gravity field with all that G? Uh, you know, they, they have pure air up there. Maybe down here it's not so clean anymore. I don't know. There could be lots of reasons. Or maybe they just like, you know, the, the lower gravity where they're living on the settlement. But that's what's going to happen. Now, in the next five or 10 years, people like us, we're going to go into space. We're going to go visit Voyager Station and then the Gateway Spaceport. And, and the majority of people are going to go up there and come back. It's going to be this kind of weekend thing or maybe a week-long vacation. But it's going to change so much that uh, it's going to make life right now kind of unrecognizable. When they, when they think back, gosh, remember the time when we just couldn't go into space when we wanted to? That's what it's going to be like. Yeah, and I... I would like to ask, what, where do you think we would be right now if it wasn't for Elon Musk and SpaceX? Um, and where would OAC be right now um, without sort of the, um, without SpaceX really just slashing, you know, launch costs uh, for, for the industry? Well, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question on the business side. Um, it seems like they would be on the technical side, but actually it's not. Um, Blue Origin started before SpaceX did. And Jeff Bezos, uh, which is, I think today, the richest man in the world, yesterday he wasn't, and anyway, that goes back and forth between him and Musk. The two richest people in the world both have ambitions off world. They both wanted to build large ships and they want to build large stations up there and so forth. So, you know, this is going to happen not just because of Musk, but because that there's a lot of people of wealth and influence that want to see this happen. It's at the point right now where it's inevitable. And that's why when I talk about building Voyager Station, it's inevitable. When I talk about building the Gateway Spaceport, it's hard to imagine right now. It is inevitable. It's going to be built. Even if, if, if OAC you know, failed to go through it, there would be somebody else who would come along because those big rockets hit there. And then because those, those men of wealth and influence want to see this happen, it's inevitable. So yeah, you, know, you are going to go into space in your lifetime. You are going to visit one of these stations. You're probably going to go to the moon too. And the most important thing is you're going to be able to afford it. Yeah. And I thought I'd also, um, before we move on to some more questions from our, um, from our members, um, ask, you know, what do you see as kind of the main obstacle for A, OAC and B, the space industry at large? Um, this is going to sound Pollyannish, overly optimistic, but there's really none. There are no obstacles in our way right now. Um, if, if there was no OAC, someone else would do it because they're Starship. You know, we, like I said, it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, we're going to eventually be giving SpaceX more money than anybody else because there's not going to be just one space construction project or two or three. There's going to be dozens of them up there. Um, space solar power is just one of them. And the, the person who approached is John Mankins, a very respected person in the space industry. He said, I don't need, I don't need you know, two or three of these uh, solar power orbiting platforms. I need a hundred of them because the demand is going to be there. If we just built solar power generating platforms for him, we would be busy, but we're not. We're probably gonna have to have divided workforces who are, that are building space stations over here, uh, solar power generation over here, um, a, a follow on to Arecibo, which destroyed itself a little while ago. That's gonna be built over here. There's just a lot of projects that are coming and the space construction industry is gonna flush out with lots of companies and lots of suppliers. It's inevitable. There's nothing standing in our way. There was, now if you asked me that a couple of years ago, I would say the one thing that could cause it to fail would be the financial um, investment levels. But the financiers are on board too now. You've seen the projections, you know, trillions of dollars in the next 20 years. 
even those projections are low. It's going to be even more than that because those those people who did those projections, they weren't counting on space construction, building spaceports and space stations like we are. I know that's going to happen because I'm developing the tools to do it right now. I'm talking with the companies that are going to help us develop those tools and those machines. It's inevitable. It's coming and it's going to be big. Um, before we move into questions for my members, one final question for me. Sure. Um, and this is a question we're going to be, we, we've asked all our speakers this term and we'll be asking all the rest of our speakers this term. And that is, what is the one thing we should all be thinking about but aren't? Hmm. What should we be thinking about that aren't? Well, I have to kind of remove myself from my position because I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a, uh, I am thinking about these things that uh, we should be, but we're not thinking about right now. I guess it's the change. I guess it's the change of lifestyle. You know, we think of, of getting around the world by going to the airport and we get on a plane and we go to, to Bangkok or uh, Tokyo or, you know, or Paris or New York. It's going to be the same thing with going to places around the world on a rocket, but it's going to be the same thing going to these new cities in orbit that don't have names yet. And they're gonna have different flavors, the same way that uh, the Bangkok is different from Paris. You know, there's gonna be orbiting uh, cities up there that you go to that are that are fun and exciting. And in, in, in you have maybe different gravity levels. Uh, maybe the, the, gate, the gateway will be rotating uh, to generate both lunar gravity in the LGA and Mars gravity and the, the outer one. But maybe there's ones that are gonna be, that are pulling just a half a G. Maybe we'll, we'll name them after mythical planets, you know, um, uh, from like Avatar or something. What was the name of that planet in that, that movie? Um, Pandora, you know, or something like that. There's going to be new cities. Um, and, and, and the people in those cities may be a little bit different uh, in ways that I just I can't foresee. Maybe because they live in space all the time or, or maybe because um, because the, the, the country that helped build those cities has deposited upon that their flavor of, uh, of what, it's, what this should be like. I don't know, it's, it's hard to project these things. I only know that it's coming and it's coming soon. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, this really makes one think about changing um, what the, 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 the phrase expanding one's worldview to expanding one's view of the universe. Um, and with that, I've got some questions from our members. Um, so I've got one from, from Claire Haroche, who's a alumnus of Sunville College. Um, and Claire asks, um, you're talking about a timeline of a couple of years. Um, has the pandemic had an impact on the project um, and will it, or has it slowed it down? Good question, Claire. It has slowed us down. Um, when, we, um, when we built or had built um, the D-Star Force last summer, uh, we didn't have it made in California. We had it made out of state. And the reason was because the pandemic had kind of shut things down here. So we've lost some time, but we found a way to, to move ahead by having someone else make it uh, where they could. And um, we're, you know, we're going to take delivery of this thing uh, in 30 days. And um, we don't know if we can you know, get hands on, if we can get together and work on it. We're, we're hoping we are. A couple of our, our, our team has gotten uh, um, inoculated, gotten vaccinations, but the whole team hasn't. So, you know, it's, it's a question mark. Um, we know when, when everybody gets shots in the arms, we're all going to be working together. And that's probably when a six month time. Uh, but we don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. It could uh, set back our demonstration that we want to do in 60 days. So that's uh, that is an unknown, but it's it's a temporary inconvenience, I believe. Yeah, and you know we all very much hope that we're going to be back to normal, um, and that the next term, hopefully, our events will be from our chamber. Um, it's a shame that this term that hasn't been the case um, because it would have been great to have you back in Oxford. Um, I would this love Oxford. I have yeah. fond memories of my time there. I, I, your guests haven't been told this, but I was there in 84. I, uh, I was there just for Trinity term, just for a short time. And I had a job there and everything. And it was, it was great. It was a really good experience. I love England. I, I always have, and I haven't seen enough of it. My family name comes from England. There's a town in Northern England called Blinko, you know, I mean, so I just, I, I, I live there, but I want to come back and it's been a long time. Absolutely. And um, we've got another question. Um, 
which is what challenges do you meet as a space entrepreneur? I'm a business consultant and I'm very passionate about the space industry. And I wonder what business development or management issues do you usually meet? Um, yeah, if you're going into the space industry, your timing is really good. Uh, there's so many opportunities right now. Uh, when you, if you, if you just looked at the space construction industry, you know, if you just looked at the tools that we need, there's a lot of them, but there's a lot of services that we need too. And, um, a, a lot, a lot of people whose experience like, well, like me. Okay. I mean, I was a pilot and, uh, now I'm CEO of a space construction company. Um, the more business experience you have, of course, the better, but don't let that hold you up. Get a team together when you figure out what you want to build. Um, one of the companies that we're working with right now, Kitely on Technologies, building electron beam world heads for us. They're a small company. There's, they're only like, you know, five or six people. And, um, you know, they weren't CEOs of anything before this. They just decided, okay, there's a need for this. And they got into it and they did it. And it's, and it's going to be like that. Like, much like the, the internet revolution, where small companies were springing up all over the place. And the sector had a lot of investment money coming in because the returns were coming back too. It's going to be the same thing with space. You know, the fast turnaround is going to come from, from, from launch being affordable and launch happening frequently. You know, you can get manifested for a launch and you can do it affordably. So don't hold back. Um, now I'm not saying don't finish your school. If you, if you want to get your MBA, that's going to help you. But, uh, but yeah, get going on it. I've got a more technical question from uh, James Russell. And James asks, Building a rotating entry point of Voyager requires a big engineering step in creating rotating seals. How do you plan to overcome this? Uh, the way the Voyager station is designed, uh, the docking uh, hub in the center of it, it's designed to despin. The station always remains spinning. But when a craft comes to dock, especially um, uh, um, a starship, when it's coming to dock, we despin those docking arms so that it doesn't have to spin up. Now, the reason that we don't want Starship to spin up is because if there's residual fuel in the tanks from launch, uh, once you start rotation, it could go to one side. And once it goes to one side, it can cause a wobble. It would require fuel to stop that, to counteract that, uh, that offset in center of gravity. We don't want them to have to do that. We'd rather despin the station and then we unload all the people um, into the station that way. Now, uh, of course, what we're gonna do is we're going to spin up uh, the starship after it's docked, but the docking arms themselves can hold the starship in a stabilized fashion without having to use any kind of ACS fuel, uh, which is added to control system. So we designed, we designed Voyager station to be the first generation of stations to spin, but can accommodate spacecraft that aren't designed to spin themselves. Later on, that'll be different. When you see um, videos of, of the Gateway spaceport, you see spacecraft coming in to dock with it. They'd also go into rotation. But those are craft that are designed to do that. This first generation of, of launch vehicles to take people in space like Starship, they're not designed to do that. And so that's why we designed the, the Voyager station to have a despun center section docking hub. And um, we've got another question. Um, and um, before I get, go to that question, please do keep submitting the questions. Um, we've got a lot rolling in. Um, please keep them coming. Um, so we've got another question now, which says, um, where will you find the physical resources to keep building those structures? Um, so because I, I, I assume that eventually when we go further and further out to space, it's not going to, Makes sense to be transporting all those resources from Earth um, uh, when you're doing construction. So how 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 are you going to go about that? Our focus right now is low Earth orbit construction. We can even do a higher Earth orbit construction, but the materials will come from Earth. Um, in order to use what they call in situ resources, which is uh, taking asteroids and, and breaking them down into uh, constituent parts and where you can start forming metals from them. It requires both a mining operation and a processing operation. Now, there have been companies that want to do in-space in mining, but that's only half of it. You still have to have the processors. But you know, we're a space construction company. If somebody wants to start uh, you know, processing, we'll build a processing facility for them. That's what we do. Um, but the most important thing is not those two processes I just described. The most important thing is the marketplace. Right now, there's no space construction companies that I know of, at least not uh, serious efforts going on. There may be a couple of them that are talking about it, but the two that we lost, uh, Planetary Resources, and I uh, can't remember the other one. Um, 
anyway, uh, they went out of business because not because of their ambitions to do the mining, they could do that, but there was no one on orbit to buy their wares. But when space construction starts, that's going to change. We'll buy all the structural metals that they can bring us. Uh, we'll build the processing facility that can process those ores into uh, um, structural members that we can use too. The key to the whole thing I'm trying to point out here is space construction is going to become the focal point towards a lot of things moving outward. If you want to go to the moon, you need a fuel depot. Guess who's going to build that? We are. We can build the fuel depots for that. And when you're fueling up your craft, you don't want to have a bunch of people on board. So you're going to take them to a rotating space station. We can build that too. Power generation, habitation, fuel depots, all at the center of that is going to be space construction. So that's why the formation of a space construction industry right now is so crucial. All right, we've got another question from Richard Reynolds. Um, and Richard asks, what is your source of inspiration for this project? Do you draw anything from sci-fi novels, movies, etc.? Novels and movies and etc. Yes, all of them. Um, I want what I had in aviation, flying around the world with ease, getting on a jet at an airport. Because uh, you know, when I was a pilot, I could jump seat, which means I could fly for free. If I wanted to go anywhere, I'd go down to LAX and I would walk onto a Delta flight or a United flight going someplace. And I'd ask the crew, "Hey guys, can I get a ride someplace?" Sure, no problem. Take a seat. It was that easy. I'd get on a jet and off I'd go to Beijing, off I'd go to Milan, off I would go to Rio. That easy. I want the same thing in space. I want people to be able to go to an airport or spaceport in this case, buy a ticket and they can go to a low earth orbit city or beyond. They can go to, to a, a lunar city. And all this can happen really fast if we develop a space construction industry that will eventually uh, support lunar construction industries and, and Martian construction industries. They're gonna do all this stuff. This is all going to happen so fast, it's gonna be extraordinary because there's a lot of drive behind it and the money's now coming behind it too. Yeah, and I mean, I thought, I thought I'd ask myself, why do you think um, you know, we've seen such a boom in the last few years specifically um, rather than prior to that? Well, um, one of the big inspiration points in the last couple of years uh, was when Elon's rockets landed um, when, you know, because a lot of us, when, when you had the grasshopper running around, bouncing around uh, Texas, that was impressive. For me, though, I kept saying to myself, but can you land a craft, come back from orbit? And then he did it. And it was like, that changes everything. Rockets are now going to be just as reusable as airliners, maybe not quite as reusable, but over time they will be which means the price is going to come down to almost nothing. And everybody's mind in the space industry projected right from that on point on out of how the prices were going to drop and how everything was going to happen. And the financial analysts, they saw this too. They saw that, wow, everything's going to be affordable. You know, it wasn't affordable to build a large fuel depot on orbit before this. Now it is, which means now we're going to the moon. Now we're going to build large structures in orbit. And that's what's just is started this huge march of, of, of technology and money in the direction of space. And it's not going to stop. It's going to keep going. It's going to be the next most influential realm, the way air power and where aviation did in the 50s and the 60s. Yeah, and I, th I think one thing we haven't really touched about, touched upon tonight, um, is kind of the role of the military in space, because obviously recently we saw um, the last couple of years, we saw the U.S. Space Force founded um, by the previous U.S. administration. Um, and so Edward Reynolds asks, do you see a large part of your organization in the future being aligned with the U.S. military or working with the U.S. military and um, towards their objectives, i.e. the Space Force? I do. And uh, I didn't at first. When Space Force uh, first formed, um, I was kind of skeptical of it, like a lot of people were. And then I realized, no, they're right. The job of the United States Navy is to protect Americans and American assets all around the world. So we have this big Navy. Um, well, it's going to be the same thing. Right now, America has trillions of dollars of assets, non-human assets, but a lot of them in orbit right now. So the idea was, well, you don't really need people up there to protect a bunch of satellites. But guess what? We're going to be building large structures where people are going to be there, too large rotating spaceports. And after the spaceports, uh, there's gonna be settlements and so forth. So there's going to be a space force up there with people also to most of all show force. 
Um, so are there going to be space wars going on out there? I, I hope not. Um, the greatest thing the American military ever did was just deterrence. Just being strong enough, uh, it, it avoided uh, the, cold, the Cold War from getting hot. And I hope that continues. If that's what it takes to keep a war from coming, having a strong military, then I'm all for it. So when we start putting assets into orbit, assets on the moon, people up there, there's going to be military force there too. And I hope that they just continue doing what they've been doing, which is keeping wars from happening, just acting as a deterrent. So do you think it's kind of inevitable then that other countries do are going to try and um, get more of a military hold in, um, in space? Yeah. Do you, guys, do you remember an old book by, I think his name was Maher. I, I'm not real sure. He wrote a book called um, The Influence of Sea Power on, on Seagoing Nations or something like that. Seminal book. It was all about, mainly about how England had, with a very powerful navy, it could control the world because it controlled the sea lanes. Well, in World War II, that changed to air power. General Billy Mitchell bombed a bunch of uh, 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 battleships in the bay. He missed them. It didn't matter. He still sunk them because the, 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 if, they, if they landed close enough, those bombs would cave in the sides of the ships and they sank anyway. He showed that it was a change of sea power to air power. And the next realm of influence is going to be space power. Those who can control things in space or have uh, a... a a large enough military to show a deterrent are going to be once to be they're going to be influ influential in the future what's going on up there so it's really important right now yes to militaries all around the world they're all looking at this mm -hmm. all right we've got time for a couple more questions um so we've got one that's about the environment um and so they ask is going to space compatible with environmental issues um, yes, it is, um, if you do it right. Uh, when you have more rockets going up through the atmosphere and, it's in the, and the amount of pollutants that they produce going up is nothing compared to the airliners, which are out there, and the ships also, and then the cars and so forth. But over time, it will have, a, have more of a factor. But the offset to that is going to be solar power generation on orbit, which is going to allow for the, 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 the use of power down here uh, with only receptors. Uh, all you have to do is have a microwave receptor out there and you can bring the power in. So it is my hope um, that uh, that is a, a manner which we can have kind of a carbon offset for the launches that are coming. Now in the future, there's going to be propellantless launch. There's going to be different uh, ways of launching things into orbit. Um, that's not my field, so I couldn't tell you about them. Um, but they, you know, there's lots of different manners that people have been looking at of uh, putting things up into orbit without having rockets to take them there, uh, mass drivers and so forth. Those are going to be developed and uh, they're inevitable. Uh, you know, rockets, the chemical fuels and so forth, they're not really that efficient in the long run. Um, electric drive going into space will, will take the place of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we've got time for one final question. Um, and so, all right. So what do you do when you're not thinking about space? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, okay. One of, my, one, of my, one of my favorite pastimes is I like to read a lot. Um, all my life I've read. I read a lot of science fiction. Larry Niven's one of my favorites. Arthur C. Clarke is one of my favorites. Heinlein. Um, and I love to watch TV. Um, because space movies and space programs have gotten really good. One of my favorites is The Expanse. Um, it, it is a, a projection of a couple hundred years in the future. I don't see it being that far off. I see it being 50, 60 years in the future to where we have people living in the belt and we have colonies on Mars and so forth. Um, you know, they see 200 years. No, it's going to happen a lot faster than that. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you everyone for coming and for submitting all those questions. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting John today. So again, John, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dara. It's a pleasure being on your show.